Good evening, everyone. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. So we welcome all of you who are seated in front of us physically. We welcome all of you live streamers. I'm sorry, I don't know where the camera is. We welcome you from Ireland and from all parts of the globe. Yes, 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 yes. There were about um, 60 to 70 people registered virtually, so we welcome you. Um, let's just start with some deep breaths. It has been clinically shown that if you inhale four seconds, hold it for four seconds, and exhale for four seconds, that the stress hormones are decreased. And I think there's, this is a season of great stress on the planet. So let's take collective breaths to just diffuse some of the collective stress all around us and perhaps within us. So let's do that at your own pace. Four breaths in, hold for four, release for four. Just do that a few times. Breath of God, breathe on us this evening. You know what has drawn each person to this room, to this place, to this time. Meet our hunger, satisfy our thirst. In Christ's name we pray, amen. amen. So we welcome you to our first Contemplative Leadership Conference. A little secret, we aimed to keep the first conference small on purpose because of the pandemic and also because we had like three months to prepare and they said, it can't be done in three months. And I said, well, how about we keep it really modest? So there is a 2.1 that's gonna be open to more people and it's already set March 9 through 11, 2023. Please mark your calendars. And guess what? I got my dream team for that. Everyone I asked, Within 24 hours, he said, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> and that happened three days ago. So I'm allowed to announce it now. So we welcome you to Contemplative Practices for Liberative Justice, Prayer as Resistance. I'm going to um, pack, unpack that a bit more tomorrow morning. But let me just say a few words on what some of those words mean with the promise that you'll hear more tomorrow. For our purposes this evening, there are many different definitions for contemplative, but the one that I want us to consider is the one from Ignatius of Loyola. Contemplative prayer is simply me gazing upon the God who gazes upon me with love. It's the eyes locking in prayer. That can be done in stillness, it can be done while you're swimming, for me, I love to meet God while I'm biking. It can be highly kinesthetic. Your body can be involved. So contemplative prayer is simply the way that you most deeply connect with the intimate presence of love, the God who gazes upon you with love. Liberative, if I can say a brief word about liberative, and then I'll say a brief word about justice. I'm gonna let Luke Speak for me, liberative. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He un unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. 
The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Christ, the God of liberation, comes to set us free from internal and external shackles. Amen. Whatever that may mean to you, you know. Whatever that means to your community, to our society, you know, we know. But that's one of the ways I want us to think about liberative injustice. Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Mishpat, the Hebrew word, is for the God who decides what's right and wrong, the God who discerns, who pronounces, hey, that wasn't right. Yo, you're not treating that person right, and calling us to account. Mishpat. What about Sedek? righteousness, right relations, making sure everyone is treated fairly, humanely, with full dignity as the image of God. So we'll speak more on this tomorrow as well, but liberative justice means right relations, God declaring what is right in our relations, what needs to be healed for the liberation of all of God's people. How? How is that grounded? By gazing on the God who gazes on us with love so that we do not burn out in the work that is so painful. So we thank you for joining us this evening. We have such a rich assembly of beautiful, beautiful souls um, that will be a real treat for us. Before I introduce our panel, we're going to have an opening prayer from Pastor Karen of Westminster Presbyterian Church. And Z is going to do the body language, the sign language for Pastor Karen. And then, and then President Craig Barnes will offer brief words of welcome, and then we'll head into the panel. So please, Thank feel you. free. Thank you, Pastor Karen. Most of you know the song, Spirit of the Living God. Yes, mm -hmm. fall afresh on me. Um, Westminster sings it just about every Sunday as our prayer of illumination because St. Augustine said, whenever you sing, you pray twice. Now, I've yet to become a liturgical dancer, uh, so the, the nearest dancing that I do is with my hands. So we're gonna sign and sing together. We're gonna do it in English twice, and then I'm going to invite you to sing along in Spanish. I'll give you one verse at a time, amen? you to use your body. This is a body prayer. Oh, can you use the mic? So you still have to, oh, yeah. sorry. Can you put the mic by my Yeah. Okay. Like the, we'll get it right. <laughs> okay, so this hand goes over here, and then as if you're picking something up, it's the Holy Spirit around your body. Spirit of the living, two L's of the living, and you make a circle in front of your body of the living. God, you point up to heaven, but you also acknowledge that God is here with us on earth. Of the living, again, spirit, of the living, God, fall afresh on me, and then melt me mold me, fill me, imagine a cup that's filled to the brim, fill me, and then give yourself away, use me, and then we do it again, spirit of the living God, amen? amen. I'm not a soloist, so everyone needs to be singing. <laughs> I am a prayer worshiper, but I am not a soloist, ready? <laughs> Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Man. Hold me. 
Holy, holy, holy God, thank you that you promise us that where two or three are gathered in Jesus' name, you are in the midst. Lord, we welcome you amongst us and celebrate the gift of life that you have lavished upon each of us. We ask that you would open our ears so that we may hear your voice. Open our minds so that we may receive your eternal wisdom. Open our spirits so that we may know your leading and guidance. And open up our hearts so that we may receive your wonderful love and be compelled to love and serve others. We ask all this in the glorious name of Jesus Christ, the risen one. Amen. 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 Sing it over. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Karen. Thank you for bringing the spirit to us. Now, President Craig Barnes here to welcome us. Every time I follow Pastor Karen, I feel like I'm just here to give the altar call at this, <laughs> this point. I love you too. <laughs> 
Uh, no, it's my privilege uh, to be asked to uh, share a few words with you before the conference uh, launches underway. Um, you know, and I'm often, as the president of the seminary, asked to say a few words. And so lately I've been uh, trying to remember which words do I say the most over the years. Uh, I, I say please a lot. Um, <laughs> you please do this for the seminary. Or can you please stop doing that? Uh, I, uh, so I say please a lot. I say words of gratitude uh, often. Thank you for what you have done uh, for the seminary. Thank you for your ministry. Thank you for your scholarship, your dedication, your hard work. <clears throat> I say uh, I'm sorry a lot. That comes with any president of an institution. I apologize for the ways that the institution has hurt individuals or groups of people or the ways that I have. And we are a community um, centered only in the forgiving grace of Christ. Uh, but my favorite words to say are welcome. I love getting to say welcome. Welcome. Uh, because we are uh, not just a school. We are a co covenant community. We are bound together as God has made commitments to us. We make commitments to each other to stick together, even when that is hard and difficult, uh, but out of a commitment to the Christ who sticks with us. Uh, and so welcome to the community. Welcome those of you who are part of the resident community. Welcome to those of you who live around here but are here uh, present for uh, this conference. Uh, welcome to those of you who've come from a very far distance uh, to be a part of this. Welcome to those of you who are with us online who are very much a part of uh, the conference. I'm here to say you're also a part of the community. Uh, you all belong here. Uh, you make us richer by being here, and we are delighted that you are here. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I also want to affirm the importance of this conference on the relationship of spirituality to the pursuit of justice, uh, the relationship of prayer to resistance of injustice. I really want to commend uh, Professor Lee for the organization of this and those who've worked with you, Bo, in putting this together. It's exactly the right uh, thing to be talking about and a wonderful way to begin this series and, and the uh, conferences, which will become one of the legacies of the Center on uh, uh, Leadership and Spirituality. Um, but what a wonderful way to begin, because the, the uh, journal assumption uh, is that spirituality is something that you go to to retreat, uh, to retreat away from the things that are difficult, like the pursuit of justice. Um, and uh, by pulling them together, uh, you help us resist that, uh, that terrible, terrible bifurcation of spirituality and justice. In fact, if there is any spirit and spirituality, we will, of course, find ourselves empowered and envisioned once again to pursue the reign of Christ on, on this earth. And it is uh, a very, very dangerous thing to try to pursue justice without spirituality. Um, on the way over here, as I was thinking about the conference, I was remembering an extraordinary sermon, one of my favorite sermons I've heard ever by Dr. James Forbes. He was preaching on Mark 9 uh, when the disciples were having a hard time casting the demon out of the boy. And uh, Jesus does it, and the disciples says, why could we not do it? And Jesus says, this kind comes out only by much prayer. And Dr. Forbes then went on to pause and say, if you're going to go after something demonic in this world, you had better have your spiritual act together. And that is exactly the call of what it means to be a disciple following Christ, to cast out evil, to resist it at every turn. And how dare we try to think we can do that on our own power apart from the spirit. So blessings on this conference, on the importance of it. Thank you again for those of you who've organized it and welcome. Thank you, Craig. So now, ready for our august panel. We have nine people with us because Shane Claiborne couldn't be here physically, so we'll hear him at the midway point. So what I'm going to do for those of us who have attention challenges, I'm going to introduce the fir first five panelists, then we're gonna take like a you know, little stretch break, 
we'll stay in the room, but do a little stretch break, and then I'll introduce the next person. You're going to have to hold your horses for our last four introductions to help with our attention. So some of these bios, uh, the longer bios are on the website. You have the QR code, which will give you the bios, the workshop descriptions, all of that on your phone. But some of these shorter bios were sent in to me. Some I had to do on my own from the website. You might be able to know which is which. All right. <laughs> this one I, I, I did. Leonard McMahon, my dear brother is a doctoral candidate in theology at the Graduate Theological Union at Berkeley with work in spirituality, theology, and politics. He created a consultancy called Common Ground Dialogue, where he works to bring diverse citizens into deeper conversation for the, for the sake of our democracy. Beautiful political theologian, I'm so blessed to have you here, Leonard. My dear brother and father in the spirit, Andrew Scott Nicky. Now, this is the description he gave me, but he didn't tell you that he is an award-winning author, highly decorated, but that's not what he sent me. He described himself as an activist scholar, deeply involved in creating a pathway for the formerly incarcerated and imprisoned to obtain a free education at Manhattan College. Woo! <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. Leonard and I are working on a book right now, and we've invited Andrew to contribute, and we said he'll be our Thomas Merton in that volume. Amen. So we've invited him. Juliet Liu, dear sister in the faith, steadfast, loyal pastor of Life on the Vine, a contemplative, liturgical, and justice-oriented church in the suburbs of Chicago. I first met Juliet on a panel where she spoke um, on the topic of black Asian solidarity. And I was so struck by the depth of her presence and the keenness of her mind. And I said, I want to be her friend. That's why she's here. <laughs> Kaz Todd Pearson, director of The Simple Way, a small organization in Philadelphia supporting neighbors as we work to have a neighborhood where we all belong and flourish together. I first met Kaz at a Justice Network conference I was blown away to hear about how she grounds her work in the city, in the neighborhood, at the, at the most difficult areas, um, like in Ken near Kensington, Pennsylvania, but grounded in contemplative prayer, grounded, grounded. And right after Cass speaks, Shane Claiborne will send in his video message. You know Shane from his books, Irres you know, Irresistible Revolution, right? Speaker, activist, uh, well-known author, Shane worked with Mother Teresa in Calcutta and founded The Simple Way in Philadelphia. He heads up now Red Letter Christians, a movement of folks who are committed to living as if Jesus meant the things he said. Amen. Amen. So then after these five, we'll pause and introduce the next five. The next four. And I didn't tell Mako and Hajin because I didn't see you yet, but there will be a five minute sign. Can you lift it up, Rini and Boha, when your five minutes have passed to invite you to, to wrap it up? All right, thank you. Okay. Oh, wow. And that sign is behind this lovely young lady here, Lynn Marie. Okay, see, I was going to use you as an excuse, so if I didn't see. Thank you, thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Ah, yes, Dandes. And hello to Ireland uh, and whomever else is out there in, in the virtual world. Uh, uh, my last name is McMahon, and so I'm part of the Irish diaspora. Um, and I was in Ireland a few years ago, and I just had a wonderful experience. So I'm so glad that you could be joining us uh, for such a lovely place. Let me start, and I have only five minutes, really quickly, with a personal touch. Why am I here? What got me to where I am today? Well, it all started with a Diana Ross song called Love Hangover. Yeah. I'm from Detroit, Michigan, by the way. So, um, you know, Motown comes naturally to me. And I was sitting as a, as a young person. I, I won't, well, I was a child. I'll just say that. Uh, and my mother was cleaning the house, and she loved to play this song, Love Hangover. And I got struck by the words, love hang over and you know how you would draw out this love you know you know if you know the song and I couldn't understand why if love was such a strong and compelling thing this was a hit song if everybody knew what love was why was there so little of it in the world why did it seem as if the 
uh, there were some monstrous gaps in the field of love out in the world, right? And so that has been my driving force ever since, uh, the gap between the public and the private. Everyone knows love. We sing it. We do it all the time in, on, on Sundays, right? We use the words in our hymns and we say in our prayers. But why in our daily lives does it seem to be so absent, particularly in our democracy? So as Bo mentioned, um, I have a consulting firm called Common Ground Dialogue. And that started because I um, was inspired by Thomas Merton to bring together the public and the private. And many of you probably know, you know a lot of the essays from Thomas Merton. I'm sure I'm not the only fan in the room here. Uh, you know, New Seeds of Contemplation or uh, any other, you know, No Man's Island or any of these other books, right? But how many people here know Seeds of Destruction? Oh, see, one hand, that's one hand. Two hands, I see two hands. That's, that's a text he wrote, you know? Um, prior to the 60s, actually, but it, it prefigures a lot of the struggles of the 60s. What about Faith and Violence? Okay, seriously, I'm asking seriously, has anybody heard? Okay, just one person. See, essays in these volumes are like Letters to a White Liberal, The Hot Summer of 67, Events and Pseudo-Events. This for me is contemplation. This for me is contemplation. This is why I clapped when um, it was announced that um, Andrew, and I'm going to finish here because I want to hear Andrew's presentation. I'm, I'm geeking out over here. Andrew is, a, I'm, I'm having a, he's a hero of mine and he, you know, now he knows it because I've been talking zero. Um, but, you know, the idea that we live these public lives and these private lives that seem so distinct and so separate, this is something I wanted to break down. So real quickly, the Common Ground Dialogue might seem like, it's inspired by Howard Thurman, it might seem as if uh, we all have this common ground and we all share it and that's what we, you know, we need to reach for and strive for in our democracy. Yes, but contemplation, right, teaches us that if you blend the private and the public, it's not that we all have the same common ground, it's that each of us has a common ground that we need to get in touch with so that therefore we can make community with each other. That's how the dialogue part comes into the common ground. See, if it was just common, you wouldn't need the dialogue. But you need the dialogue out of your common ground. So tomorrow I'll be presenting twice uh, in, a, in a workshop the notion that a good contemplative is a good democratic citizen and that on the contemplative level, religion can be a powerful force, a constructive force in the public square. It does not have to be destructive. I think if anyone you know, of us turned on the, the news channel and watched it for you know, even half a day, uh, we would get the impression that we're on the brink of civil war. Right? Uh, and so part of my goal is to empower ordinary, everyday Christians, not necessarily in the leadership class, although I'm sure we have some folks in the leadership class here amongst us, but not necessarily in the leadership class, but folks who are in the pews every day, who you know, go to work every day, who gather around the water cooler every day, how to bring their faith into the public square without exclusivity and without dominating universalism. And that is my time. So I'm looking forward to seeing as many of you as I can tomorrow. Thank you. I'm Andrew, everybody. I'm going to try your patience if you don't mind. Uh, this is an essay I got two weeks ago from one of the students I'm teaching at the jail in the Bronx uh, this semester. This gentleman's name is Franklin Encarnacion. It was 5 a.m. when the correction officer came tapping on my bed thinking I was asleep. Encarnacion, you have court, he said. Yeah, yeah, I know. I replied from under the covers. I was awake already. As a matter of fact, I was up all night and didn't get any rest because I was so overwhelmed with emotions. Thoughts of what I could have, should have, would have done differently only made me grow and more, more and more frustrated because I just couldn't accept my reality. Before heading out, I brushed my teeth and washed my face. I looked up and couldn't help but glare at the person glaring back at me through the scratched up and foggy mirror. I couldn't even recognize myself nor believe what my life had come to. 
the boy who had once had dreams of being a professional baseball player and musician is now in jail facing a long time in prison. Time I will never get back, time I will be away from my family and friends, time that I now found to be so precious and priceless. When I got down to the intake area, I experienced one of the most humiliating and dehumanizing procedures an inmate suffers while incarcerated, a strip search. On the bus transferring us to court, I stared out the window at everybody going about their day-to-day -day routines, kids on their way to school, people driving to work, people opening their businesses, others getting breakfast. What I saw was people living an honest, normal, productive life while I was miserable and uncomfortable on a bus, cuffed to another inmate. Finally, I arrived at the Bronx County Supreme Courthouse and went through more security procedures before I was placed in a cold cell down in the basement. Angela Davis states, 2.2 million people are in prison and jail in the U.S., another 4.7 million on probation and parole. Knowing that so many people are behind bars in this country or being monitored made me lose a sense of hope for myself. It made me feel that I would just become another part of this sad and unfortunate statistic. Anxiety twisted my stomach into knots. This anxiety was like the nervous feeling you get when something really scary is about to happen. I paced back and forth in the small holding cell that smelled like someone who hadn't showered in months. In the corner was a dirty metal toilet that reeked of urine and a metal sink that didn't work. The walls were covered with graffiti, drawings, gang member names, and all the hate the guys that were in this cell before me had for the police and the Department of Corrections. What really stood out to me was the big block letters that read, God's plan. I'm not gonna stop there because I think it's God's plan that we have lost at least two generations of young black and brown men. It's not God's plan that they have become an underclass for whom the dreams that are so realizable for you and I are absolutely science fiction and out of their reality. I don't deny that people pick up a gun because they want to pick up a gun. I'm not so naive to say that. But I can't help but say that I have gone through a decades-long fog of sadness because I have met in 50 years, folks, working in jails and prison, thousands, thousands of Franklin Encarnacion's, and I'm sick to death because of it. And I can't sleep at night because of it. And I ache for God because of it, because contemplation is the only thing that keeps me from falling into despair. I think the greatest gift God ever gave me, and all of us can talk about God's gifts, and we'll all spend an eternity in gratitude. Most of us don't even know how many we've gotten, but I have one, and that was when I was 19 years old, I was asked by my, chem uh, my math professor at Marquette University, because I was in a rock and roll band, to come and play for incarcerated women, and I said, okay, I could do that. And I got there, and I saw the face of the suffering Christ. And it has touched me all the way to my soul. And whatever I've done in my life, and I've done a lot of bad things, I'll talk about those tomorrow. It's the only thing I can say for certainty that I know. It's God's gift to me. <coughs> now you're probably saying, well, you must be really successful. No, I'm an utter failure. I've been to more funerals of people that I've taught at Rikers Island and the Bronx County Jail and the Bronx Youth Detention Center than I've been to graduations. I've watched generations of people ground up into mincemeat in the law and order machine in a society that makes um, the corporate and financial sectors absolutely immune to any criticism while we lock up black and brown kids for almost nothing. Without contemplation, I would not be here today, and I couldn't keep doing it, but it's so nice to be a useless servant. It's so nice to know that God can still use little people to do great work, because there's one thing I do believe, the cross of Jesus Christ and the power of his resurrection, 
and I believe in, with Revelation 22, that Franklin and Carnacion and all the millions like him one day will no longer need light from lamps nor the sun, for the Lord will be their light, and they will reign forever. Amen. <laughs> Um, I am just wondering if we can have a little bit of space before I jump in, just because uh, what you shared was. Um, I just could we sit with it for a little bit? Okay, it's just and then I'll. Thank you, Brother Andrew. Thank you for seeing the face of Jesus in these kids. Um, I was asked by Bo to speak a little bit on the relationship uh, between trauma and contemplative practices um, to bring healing. Um, so I'll just start by saying that as a, as a pastor, I believe that the church's central calling is uh, to not only be announcers of new creation, but to be enactors of new creation. Um, as the New Testament writer Paul said, the old is passing away and the new is coming. The new has come. Um, and so the old world with all of its injustices is very much still present, uh, very much still present, but it is passing away. It is in the process of passing away and the new world ordered with God's love and liberative justice is coming. And so I believe the central calling of the church is that we are to be pockets of new creation, enactors of new creation. Um, every, every local church should be a, a little movement of justice in this world. Um, but if the church is to enact this new creation that is ordered by God's love and liberative justice, then we must embody that love and liberative justice within ourselves. And not just in ourselves as individual people, but collectively as a people. And sadly, as I'm sure many of you know, um, this isn't generally what churches are known for. I mean, in fact, most of the members of my congregation carry deep wounds that have been inflicted upon them by the church. The church for them has not been a place of new creation, it's been a place of, that has inflicted damage, uh, that has been coercive in its leadership, uh, abusive, it has inflicted trauma. And so, um, you know, many members of my church express that, that our church was their last stop um, before leaving the faith tr tradition of Jesus altogether. And so as a pastor, I'm continually seeking to be more trauma-informed in the ways that I pastor. Um, and I'm always asking these questions, how do we reckon with the vast amount of damage and trauma that the church itself has brought upon people? And how do we not just repeat that same trauma on them again, but actually embody a different, more just community? How do we not only seek justice for the world out there, but how do we become ourselves a just community from which we can then witness to and point to a greater justice for the whole world, for the whole cosmos through Jesus Christ? So for us, we've found contemplative practices to be key to this, to becoming a just community. Um, I just wanted to share um, kind of two highlights. Um, the first uh, communal practice I'll, that we, we practice frequently together is the practice of lament, um, both in the more traditional worship space of Sunday mornings as well as publicly. Um, and I think that Shane may be sharing a little bit more about public lament, so I won't, I won't go into that too much. Um, but I believe that within the walls of our church, the contemplative practice of lament makes room for our pain and anger. And for those who carry trauma in their bodies, who have been hurt by the church, and often part of that trauma has been the silencing 
and the lack of space that, that has been given to those victims to speak their pain and hurt by the church. It's been covered over, it's been excused, it's been silenced. Lament as a practice invites people to speak openly about the ways that even the church has hurt them. Um, there are a lot of Christians who are uncomfortable <laughs> with the practice of lament. We can be uncomfortable with pain. We can be especially uncomfortable with anger. Um, anger is like a scary thing for a lot of Christians. Um, but I think that lament and the rage that can come with that is sometimes the most honest and maybe the most faithful response when we have encountered the great injustices and not just in our world, but within the walls of the Church of Jesus Christ. Um, anger and, and grief and lament is appropriate. And when it is shared, what I found is that when it's voiced by an entire community, when it's spoken out loud together instead of silenced, then we are experiencing something different in our bodies we're experiencing that we are not alone. To speak out loud our pain and anger together in a room, to hear the voices reverberating together, to feel those vibrations in our body from the voices that speak together, we are, we are experiencing something in our bodies that says we are not alone, we are not unseen, we are not alone in our anger. I also think that lament has a way of making us more whole as a community it's already been five minutes. Um, <laughs> I want to take anyone's time. Um, lament has a way of being able to center those who have been oppressed, to center those who have been traumatized, but lament also has a way of inviting even those who are privileged into that space. To say there's room for you here too if you can enter through the doorway of pain with us if you are willing to experience our pain and our grief with us, then we can all be here in this room together. And so that's what I really see the work of Lament doing in a, in a congregation like mine that is pretty diverse. Um, we have a diversity of stories and griefs that we carry. Um, Lament has kind of brought us together because it, it centers those who need to be centered, but it also invites everyone and says, there's room for you here as well. Um, and then the last thing I wanna talk about is just the contemplative practices of communal discernment and um, listening together to the Holy Spirit. Um, so a lot of, and I'll, I'll try to be brief about this, a lot of the, the trauma that I encounter in members of my congregation has come from leadership models that have been coercive, um, that have been very hierarchical, that have not made room for every, every member of the body, but has elevated some, and it's particularly the professional clergy at the top, and then said, the, the sort of normal people at the bottom don't have a voice here. And so I think when we, when we learn from you know, models of Ignatian discernment, and we, when we learn from the Wesleyan uh, models of discernment, and when we, you know, I think, I think the underlying truth to those is every, every human being can connect to the Spirit of God. Every human being can listen and hear the voice of the divine. And so it has like an egalitarian effect in the community. It has an equalizing effect and it says, I, as the pastor, I'm not more important than you. My voice doesn't matter more than you. There are gifts that I bring to this community, but you have gifts as well. And so if we are facing a decision as a church, I don't dictate what the decision about that is. I circle us together and I, I see my role as pastor very much like a spiritual director, where I'm facilitating um, that together we're all listening to the voice of God. And I think that's a major way that we've seen, we've, we've grown to become a more just community within ourselves through that practice of communal discernment. Um, thanks for having me. I feel, um, yeah, really honored to be um, sitting with such great people. Um, I came to the United States almost 20 years ago to do a one-year volunteer service program. And um, I came because what I thought I believed and why I believed it, I really thought worked in the world and that the people that I was going to serve needed what I had to bring. And um, 
very quickly into my time in Southwest Philadelphia, I discovered that um, nobody really wanted what I had to bring and um, that uh, something was already here, something was already there. And um, that my work in that year was to pay attention to what that was that was already there. Um, so almost 20 years later, I am still in Philadelphia and continuing to pay attention to what is already at work in the neighborhood that I live in amongst the people who find themselves there, whether by choice, whether by family connection or whether by access to the drug that helps them survive every day on the streets of Kensington. Um, and, uh, you know, what happened for me, or what has happened for me, is that um, I had to deconstruct a whole set of ideas that I had been given, con containers that helped me form ideas and ways to believe and ways to understand. And so I did a whole lot of deconstruction and um, realized that well, I guess I have to reconstruct something. And so began doing that, but realized in amongst um, the reconstruction that I was still just establishing new ideas and still not really seeing um, and, and trying to have everything fit into this, these new sets of ideas. Um, and so began to ask deeper questions and found a spiritual director who um, sat with me time after time and invited me to look mm -hmm. and to listen to myself and to listen to the sun that warmed my car, the moments that I felt the joy in my day or the sounds of the train that ran past my house or the trash that littered the streets. Where did I see and hear um, the holy? And for me, my, my definition of contemplation is a long, loving look at the mother and God within whose womb we all came from. And as I live and work in a devastating place right now, I look for that mother and God in the eyes of people who are longing to be loved to longing to know that they belong, longing to know that, that even in the state that they're in today, that they are part of God's creation. Um, Joan, um, Joan Chittister, who is really inspiring to me, says, um, God wills and the care of the poor as well as the reward of the rich. So therefore, must the true contemplative. God desires the dignity and full development of all human beings. Therefore, must the true contemplative. Otherwise the, con uh, otherwise, the contemplation is not real. Because to contemplate the God of justice is to be committed to justice. The true contemplative, the true spiritual person must do speak and insist on justice. And she goes on to speak of all of the mystics that have, got, have done that for us. So for me, I try to, I spend my days making sure that my neighbors have enough food. Yeah. And um, we serve about 150 people a week in a food choice pantry and we we put food out and we invite them to choose what it is that they want to feed their family, that they want to eat, and we connect with them. And this is my contemplation. And this is, I found such meaning in this work and, um, and I'm so grateful to, to participate in it and in the ways that we do. Hey everybody, it is wonderful to be a part of this conversation on prayer as resistance. And 
I know Kaz is going to talk about some of our local work at The Simple Way. I'm honored to be with all the other wonderful panelists, uh, conversation partners here. I wanted to talk about the intersection of public actions and public art as a way of making the good news seen and heard. Uh, so I want to show you just a couple of pictures first, because the the simple way we've always really valued art and beauty. And um, this is for a while, this was a painting on our front door that says, heal all that is broken in our hearts, in our streets and in our world. And of a reminder that salvation is personal, but it's also social. And as we you know, look at a few of these images, I've come to think of art in our neighborhood is a way that we can um, you know, proclaim the beauty of God and the good news of, of uh, God's love. This is a mural on a, on a really hard corner. It's one of our more explicitly theological. <laughs> you can see the, the lamb and the, the, the dove and the lion, the rolled away stone from the tomb and the resurrection party at the bottom. Um, uh, I know Mako's sharing a little bit too, that, that, you know, each of these is a, there's a learning curve. And uh, uh, the one thing that we learned on this one is that painting a mail container is a federal crime. Who knew that? Uh, but they were easy on us, yeah, live and learn. So these are, you know, this is an, a Banksy piece on the side of my house. It's kids standing on a pile of guns and bombs and weapons. But, you know, I wanted to focus on how we've tried to uh, stress the urgency of some of the things, the injustices that we see in our neighborhood. And one of those is the opioid epidemic, the heroin uh, uh, addiction that has taken so many lives, over a thousand lives a year lost in Philly. And we see these needles everywhere and the kids, you know, are constantly picking them up. So we eventually said enough. And one of the things that we did is we packaged those up in bottles and the young people were really the inspiration for this. We bottled up hundreds of needles and we delivered them to our city officials as a plea for help. The whole campaign was called Need a Little Help because we need a little help over here. And we had quotes from the kids. We had the names of our politicians and we delivered those as an act of public protest, but also as Martin Luther King said, our job is to make injustice uncomfortable so that people can't not respond, you know, so that we force people to respond. And as we held the press conference and some of the kids shared and some of our friends in recovery shared, we delivered those needles and it was a powerful act of public protest. We saw an immediate response from many of our officials. One of our council members said that he keeps the needles on his uh, desk to remind him of the urgency. So, you know, I think that's part of uh, what we've got to do is keep turning up the volume and finding ways to creatively do that, that stir people's hearts. This is the image of LaSalle Street Church in Chicago. Uh, and I, I love how they've made their building a part of the proclamation of good news. Of course, we welcome refugees, we're Christians. <laughs> and one of the other ways that we organized a prayerful protest around immigration was that we gathered the dreams of dreamers, of young immigrants uh, in this country, and we delivered 3,000 of those to the halls of Congress. And we knelt on our knees, uh, we, we read those dreams, and we prayed prayers um, until we were uh, arrested. And uh, this is the good trouble, right? But even as we were arrested, one of the officers told me that, um, that, that we're on the right side of history on this, you know, and we, we need to keep doing it. Uh, uh, and, and so, you know, as we think of these acts of protest, I think this is a form of prayer, right? A public liturgy of creating art in public spaces. And this is one of those protests we did around the death penalty where we carried a banner onto the steps of the Supreme Court. And we also carried the names of the 1500 plus people that have been executed over the last 40 years. Uh, it was also important for us to remember the victims of murder and to say that to be against the death penalty is not to be against justice or to say that we don't care about the victims, but we also carried many of them in our hearts. And the reason that we had two different colored roses was to remember the victims of murder and also the victims of state execution. And we laid those on the steps of the Supreme Court 
Uh, and of course we were arrested there and um, there's a little theme you see here of the good trouble but finally you know i wanted to share about the our work around gun violence um, one of the most powerful services that i've ever experienced was when we had our good friday services in front of the gun shop and that's what you see here we carried the cross in front of the gun shop we read uh, the story of Jesus's death. And then we invited the moms and dads who had lost their kids to share their stories. And this is liturgy in the streets, right? This is part of what I think we've got to begin to think of is how do we connect the good news of the gospel to our streets? One of the most powerful stories of this particular service was afterwards, one of the moms who had lost her 19 year old son came up to me and she said, I get it. I get it. Something hit me today. And I said, what? And she said, God knows what it feels like to be me. God knows what it feels like to lose your son. And that is what happens when our liturgy, our prayers uh, meet the streets. So this is liturgy in the streets. And uh, just a couple more images. This is a, a, service, a church that has put the names and ages of all the folks who died in our city from gun violence as a public installation at their church. So every time they go into worship and they leave, they're reminded of the pain in our streets. And finally, you know, we've been turning guns into garden tools, and this is one of the most powerful uh, pieces of liturgy. It really is a sacramental thing to take guns and turn them into garden tools. And we've been doing that over the last 10 years. Uh, I've got a couple of them here you know, with me that uh, this is a shovel that's made out of a gun. This one here on the screen is uh, uh, made out of an AK-47. And since we started doing it, we've had all kinds of images of art made out of guns and uh, mu musical instruments. That's a, in Mozambique. Uh, and this is in the streets of Iraq. They ran over guns and they had children drive the bulldozers. So that's uh, our work to turn guns into garden tools. And I think it's a form of prayerful liturgy because when people do that, they share their stories. We're creating a way that people can lament in public spaces. Uh, so as you continue the conversation, as we continue the conversation, I want to say that, you know, Walter Brueggemann talked about the prophetic imagination. And he says, sometimes we misunderstand the prophets and we think they were fortune tellers, but they, they weren't fortune tellers as much as truth tellers. And they weren't just trying to predict the future. They were trying to change it. And that's what our prayer, our prayers can do, right? What our protests can do. Uh, we like to say we're not just protesting, but we're protestifying how things can be different. So thanks for letting me share a few stories and images of what prayerful protests can look like. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Shane. He was really happy to be with us today via video and wanted to be with us, but is traveling. Thank you, Shane. Thank you, Kaz. Thank you, Juliet, Andrew, and Leonard. Thank you. Deep breath. Now, as we move towards our next four beautiful speakers, I have the privilege to introduce them here as well. My dear sister Lisa is the associate professor of New Testament here at the seminary. She's author of um, An Apostle in Battle, Paul and Spiritual Warfare in 2 Corinthians 12, 1 through 10. And her relatively recent book, African American Readings of Paul, Reception, Resistance, and Transformation. Now this is the first book that investigates the historical trajectory of how African Americans have understood Paul and utilized his work to resist and protest injustice and racism in their own writings from the 1700s to the mid 20th century. So thank you, Lisa, for being here. Oh, okay, sure. And then my dear colleague, Mako, many of you know his art. He's a contemporary artist, speaker, author of Art and Faith, A Theology of Making, Culture Care, Silence and Beauty, among others. He also has a beautifully illustrated Bible that's very, um, that's circulating widely. He happens to have four doctors of, on, of arts honorary degrees. Um, he's the one from whom I first learned Kintsugi and recognized that the art form of Kintsugi is not about quickly fixing broken shards, 
but gazing lovingly upon those broken pieces and giving dignity and, and um, the long gaze upon the broken pieces, mending with love. Thank you, Mako. And Mako's um, partner, Hejin, is a lawyer and entrepreneur. Hejin is the founder and managing partner of a law firm, Shim and Associates, as well as the co-founder and CEO of an amazing organization called Embers International, a global nonprofit organization. You'll hear more about their work soon. I was studying the website and was blown away by the work that they're doing there. Thank you for being here, Hejin. And now I mentioned that um, some of them sent in their own bios, right? This one you'll know. Shan sent this one in. Shan teaches leadership and get this, forgiveness studies. <laughs> He teaches forgiveness studies at Gonzaga University, poetry at Stanford, and he loves his wife, Jennifer, with abandon. And his, oh, is that Jennifer? Oh, Jennifer, nice to meet you. And his three daughters, Nat Natalia, Ariana, and Isabella, with the garment of praise instead of the spirit of despair. They have a beautiful practice where they speak that over their children, I think, daily so touched by that. So we are ready for Lisa. Thank you so much, um, Bo, for that introduction. And I'm just honored to be here with all of these wonderful panelists and all of you. Um, the spirit is definitely moving. I can feel the spirit's presence in this place. So um, I want to talk a little bit about, in the few moments I have, the connection between the spirit and justice in the New Testament which is what Bo asked me to talk about tonight. And I want to say first that the connection between the spirit and justice in the New Testament is connected to the spirit and justice in the Old Testament. Because for the writers of the New Testament, um, the Old Testament was their scripture. So the relationship that we see between the spirit and justice in the New Testament continues from what is in the Old. So one of the passages I wanted to talk about tonight, the spirit has already moved because Bo read it at the beginning. <laughs> it is Luke 4, 18 through 19. And here we see the connection between the New Testament and the Old Testament, right? Because when Jesus gets up, he opens the scroll to this place in Isaiah. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to, to proclaim release to the captives, the prisoners, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed downtrodden go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. By reading out loud these words of Isaiah, Jesus sets forth these verses as the mission statement of his ministry. He is the fulfillment in the flesh of Isaiah's proclamation. God's spirit is upon him and empowers him to bring justice to the world. He releases the captives, those in various forms of bondage, economic, physical, political, and those who suffer demonic oppression. As Robert Wall, New Testament scholar states, all Jesus does occurs by the power of the spirit. He teaches, he preaches, he heals, he casts out demons. He moves among the poor, the outcast, the sick, and the blind, end quote. For Luke, the connection between the spirit and justice is no accident, for the spirit's presence empowers resistance to the status quo and calls forth an undoing of bondage and oppression as exemplified in Jesus' ministry. The next passage I want to look at quickly about the, the connection between the spirit and justice is from Acts 6, 1 through 6. Now during those days when the disciples were increasing in number, the Hellenists complained against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. And the 12 called together the whole community of the disciples and said, it is not right that we should neglect the word of God in order to wait on tables. Therefore, friends, select from among yourselves seven men of good standing, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may appoint to this task, while we, for our part, will devote ourselves to prayer and to serving the word. What they said pleased the whole community, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, 
together with Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Taman, Parmenas, Nicolaus, a proselyte of Antioch. They had these men stand before the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. In this episode from Acts, we have a form of injustice taking place. The Hellenistic Jews who spoke mostly Greek were being neglected in the daily distribution of food by the Jews who spoke mostly Aramaic. As we can see from this passage, the Hellenistic Jews were going hungry, and so they lodged a complaint. They spoke out against what was happening to them. We could say that this speaking out was a form of protest regarding the economic disparity between the members and the unequal distribution of goods. What is the church's response to this injustice? It's not to ignore it. It's not to blame the Hellenistic Jews for being too sensitive, but to acknowledge the wrong and to try to correct it. How do they try to correct it? They ask for men of good standing or good character who are full of the spirit and of wisdom. We see in the apostles' request that there is an acknowledgement that the Spirit's presence is important in administering justice. They, the seven people are to be full of the Spirit. The text tells us that these seven are prayed for by the apostles so that they might engage in their ministry of justice in a way that coheres with their mission. So here in this passage, we see a connection between the Spirit, prayer, and bringing about justice for those being neglected or marginalized. Notice also that those put in positions of power are those from the marginalized group. The seven men chosen are Hellenistic Jews. By doing this, the church can ensure that those who have experienced pain can now experience power. The last passage, I hope I have time, <laughs> The last passage is from 2 Corinthians 11.20. Now this passage is not often thought of in terms of spirit and justice, but the connections are there if we attend closely to the text. Here Paul is writing to the Corinthians, for you put up with it when someone makes slaves of you, or preys upon you, or takes advantage of you, or puts on airs, or gives you a slap in the face. In this passage, Paul is chiding the Corinthians, a spirit-filled congregation, as we know from the, his letters to them, right? They're moving the gifts. They have all of these um, spiritual gifts operating, but they are putting up with people who are oppressing them. In 2 Corinthians, some outside missionaries have come into the Corinthian congregation, and they are abusing the Corinthians. The Greek terms that Paul uses in this verse to describe what these outside missionaries are doing to the Corinthians denote severe oppression. <clears throat> the words he uses depicts an atmosphere in the Corinthian congregation of domination, oppression, exploitation, subjugation, even violence. His words suggest that the Corinthians are being physically, economically, and spiritually abused. Paul calls upon the Corinthians to resist this type of injustice and oppression. As spirit-filled people, they do not and should not put up with this type of behavior in their midst. Here in this passage, Paul intervenes in the lives of his congregants like a loving pastor by helping them see that they are being exploited and urging them to protest and resist. Based upon what we know about the Corinthians' history with the spirit, and what Paul says in his letters to the Corinthians regarding the spirit and the spirit's power, we can say that Paul understands the spirit's presence among the Corinthians to empower them to resist these oppressive actions. These brief snapshots into several passages of the New, of the New Testament reveal some of the links between the spirit and justice that occur in the New Testament and God's call for us to embrace the divine work of justice. May God grant us a fresh outpouring of God's spirit and the courage to follow the spirit's lead in bringing about God's will upon the earth. Thank you.
Thank you. <clears throat> I went to Corinth, walked around. <clears throat> uh, it's a small city compared to ours, but uh, you can still pick up the shards from of all the ceramics. Um, I thought about that as I uh, listened and uh, thought about Kintsugi, which is part of our conversation tomorrow. Um, Evelyn Kim and Amy Lee are going to be leading in a Kintsugi session, which um, Hejin and I um, are part of creating Academy Kintsugi as um, a way to think about broken shards, brokenness that um, all of us experience in life, but more broadly, as Shane mentioned, um, it's in the streets, uh, it's in the prisons, uh, it's in congregations. Um, and Kintsugi, for those of you who may not know this term, kin is gold in Japanese, and tsugi means to mend. But tsugi also means to pass on to the next generation. So when an important tea ball breaks in Japan, uh, many earthquakes there, uh, families of tea masters will often hold on to the fragments of what has been broken for several generations before they give it to a Japan lacquer master, urushi master, to mend, not to fix, because the Japan, Japanese lacquer master will use the fissures and cracks, mend it with this uh, material, urushi, but also create design with gold on top. That's why it's kin tsugi, gold repair or gold mending. To me, it, it's one of the great examples and um, illuminations of what it means to live into the new creation. It is not, Kintsugi Master doesn't fix it so that it can just be look perfect again. Kintsugi Master knows that imperfection and brokenness is the way into new creation. And the resulting ball that Kintsugi Master has made is more valuable than the original. Because as, as important as the original ball may have been, the Kintsugi ball has been remade into a new creation. And we know all know, to, uh, as we celebrate post-Easter journeys, that um, Emmaus, our Emmaus journey is filled with appearances of Jesus appearing to us not just as a glorified human being, but appearing us as a wounded glorified human being. And that detail is very significant to me as an artist. Um, when, when I create, I think first about what the material has, has um, been through. Um, um, my, I use minerals that gets pulverized uh, by hand, mixing them with Japanese hide glue to create paint. And I paint layers and layers to create this prismatic refractive surface. So I'm listening basically to brokenness. I am creating with brokenness. And I'm opening up this possibility that beauty is, can arise out of broken shards. And as Andrew said, I love being a useless servant. Art is useless. Art fundamentally is a gift, but it cannot be used in utilitarian sense. And that's why it's essential. Art liberates us from thinking about our value based on utility and efficiency. So Emily Dickinson's dashes are everywhere in her poems. The, the editor who published one of her poems removed all of the dashes because they are useless. They do not serve any function. But Emily never published again. 
because that is her being, the essence of who she is, these dashes. So perhaps it's use dash less. <laughs> it's like stitching through broken pieces in contemplative manner to create something that is more beautiful perhaps because of the damage that it been, it's been through, the woundings that we, we've experienced. And so Kintsugi has been part of our lifestyle. Uh, Hejin and I um, not only practice Kintsugi, but bring Kintsugi to other places around the world. And uh, today, three of us are here, and Jennifer, um, we just came back from a trip to India to bring Kintsugi uh, into some of the most desperate uh, situations uh, dealing uh, in, in darkness or brothels. And so my bride is going to uh, talk about some of that. I'm going to take into a journey, so come with me. You're walking up the stairs of a really dark building. As soon as you enter, you smell all kind of filthiness. You smell garbage, urine, sperm, unspeakable smell surround you. As you go up the stairs, it gets darker and darker. And you are afraid of touching anything because everything is so filthy. You see, if you're a scientist, cancer-causing agents everywhere. You enter into a room, and it's barely seven feet by six feet. And there is only one thing in that room, and it's a bed. On this bed, you meet a tiny little woman whose body is broken. She's been trapped there for 10 years, and she's only about 20. She's been trafficked from a poor village. She's from a very poor, the lowest caste in India called untouchables. Her family has never been educated because the caste system is based on profession. They are garbage pickers. She was promised to a job in a city to be a wait staff in a restaurant because she has multiple siblings. And the only way for them to go to school is for the oldest child to make money. She follows this uncle, and this is where she ended up. She was drugged on the way on a train and she was sold into this brothel. And since she got there, she was kept in a locked room without window, and she's been there for seven years. Every single day, she gets beaten up, forced to drink alcohol and drug. And finally, in a few weeks, her will is broken. She's only 10. And I met this woman in a brothel eight years ago. And there, I met another being, a beautiful baby girl, six month old. If you can imagine the destiny of this child, she has to live in this seven by six room where her mother gets raped by different men 20 to 30 times a night. Where do you think that this little infant child, six month old, stays at night? Many nights, the mother has no choice but to force feed alcohol or drug to this infant child so that the child will go to sleep. And this is the reality of the depth of despair. In this world right now, we have about 40 million people in slavery for bonded labor and sexual exploitation. And if you can imagine 40 million, that's more than the entire population of Canada. 
And this is the largest number of slaves that we ever had in human history. Shame on us. Out of those 40 million, we have about, and this is a very conservative number, 27 million in India. That's why Embers International has started this operation to restore and empower and protect the children and women who are victims of this terrible injustice. Because human trafficking, slavery, essentially is a crime everywhere in this world. There's not a single country that actually a slavery is legal. Now, this is a crime that is so pervasive, especially in developing countries. And then do you know why? Because it is so profitable. This is number two crime that makes profit in this world. So essentially, human trafficking and slavery is profit-making criminal business by committing violence against another human being. And in this kind of depth of despair, God has given some of us to be seeking justice. And in that, the prayer is essential. So this is the moment that we have to come to the Lord because it's God-sized burden. Yes, we'll show up with God and, and, and journey with him. So what we do at Embers, I mean, there's so much to share about contemplation, and I love this topic and how this is a form of resistance, and yes. So what we do is every single day as a team, we stop our work at 1130 and then come together as a team to pray together for 30 to 45 minutes because it is our act of resistance, of relying on ourselves for this work of justice against the dark forces and spiritual evil that is behind this evil crime. And we stop everything and we pray. But we pray for four different groups of people. I'll take another 30 seconds. One is we pray for our clients and all those people who are still awaiting rescue because I know their faces. Some of our children, um, most of our children actually that we are educating right now who are the children of the women who are still in, in slavery and they, after they finish their school, they still have to go back to the brothel. We have to pray over them. And then second group, we pray for our team on the ground in India and all of our partners, our fellow anti-trafficking um, ministries and local churches that we partner, we pray for all of them. And then third group, we pray for the government. We pray for those who are in power, who can make difference, who can strengthen the criminal justice system. And then the fourth group, we pray for the perpetrators those people who are committing the crime, committing the violence against our brothers and sisters because we resist the evil behind it. So um, prayer is an integral part of our work of justice and it just cannot be, justice cannot be described or discussed without prayer. So thank you for this conference and thank you all for being, being here. <laughs> Thank you, Hajin. Beautiful. It's an honor and a beautiful thing to be a forgiveness researcher and to have worked in that field for 30 years now and visit all kinds of places around the world, mostly around commemoration of genocidal violence and the option for the possibility of forgiveness. So let's start with Emily Dickinson's three-step contemplation. I am afraid to own a body. I am afraid to own a soul. Not knowing when the dawn will come, I open every door. Take all away from me, but leave me ecstasy. Ecstasy in contemplation with the beautiful body of Christ, the ugly and wounded body of Christ, is forgiveness. 
is asking forgiveness, is making atonement, is making things right. I didn't know anything about that growing up in Montana. We had a fairly loud, angry, dominant, violent family. So these things are not uh, just in our structures and our systems or in our nation and nation relationships. They're in our marriages. They're in our parental relationships, our father-son, father-daughter relationships, our mother-son, mother-daughter relationships. So my family was pretty much destroyed. My uncle had been to prison twice. My cousin, Jason, who we loved so much, fell into the drug culture and was murdered in the streets of Billings, Montana. Um, our own family was just rough, you know, and basically falling apart. Due to my mother's, I think she would be able to say, as her life progressed, back bedroom depression, my father's alcoholism and infidelities. Everything just completely fractured. Then came Christ. And then Christ changed everything. So my parents, who had divorced, both came to Christ in, a, in the course of a year, and they remarried each other. And out went, over time, the alcoholism and the infidelities and the back bedroom depression. And in came gladness. And then we need these movements, right? So somehow in there at 17, I got to meet Jennifer who's with me, right? And, uh, you know, our family was going to church and church was important, but we still didn't know what the hell we were doing. <laughs> and it was often not taught, you know? And so, for example, I'd never heard anybody ever ask forgiveness. How strange is that in the church? Right? But then I met Jennifer, and we're sitting at the table over dinner with her mom and her dad, and her dad says kind of a sharp word to her mom. And literally, in my life, he said something like, I'm talking here. And in my life of verbal violence, that was a minus eight on our 100-point scale in my family. So I was like, that was wonderful. <laughs> and so I literally thought, that was handled really well. You know? And uh, so anyway, later... I see Fred talking to his wife, Susie, who's here too, and uh, over at the, in, kind of in the kitchen, and I'm over on the couch, and he comes and sits down next to me, and he says, I'd like to ask your forgiveness for my rudeness to my wife. And I didn't know what to do with that. I said, oh, you don't, you don't have to ask me. You know, I was trying to get out of the moment, right? And uh, he said, yeah, yeah, I, I mean, I do ask for you, but more importantly, you know, when, when we wrong someone in our family, we want to ask forgiveness not only of that person, but of everybody else who was present in order to restore the dignity of that person. So that was the contemplation of the body of Christ coming right into me. Right? And, you know, God designs us for these things, doesn't he? So that started a long love relationship with Jennifer in which we've blessed each other by touching each other with the sign of the cross every day and saying, you are my friend, you are my beloved. You are the one my soul loves. Practicing asking forgiveness at least twice a week. But sometimes I need about 50 times of myself asking forgiveness. Because I'm still sometimes a defensive bastard. Sorry, everybody. And so I have to get out of that. I have to change my life, right? Uh, genocide doesn't just come from the ether. It comes from us. Structural racism comes from us, right? How do we heal it? Forgiveness is important. In, in profound quantitative studies and forgiveness, those who have higher forgiveness capacity have significantly less anxiety, depression, anger, heart disease. Powerful bridges now to stronger immune systems. The Mayo Clinic with all cancer patients uses forgiveness therapy. And how about the Nez Perce at the site of the Big Hole Massacre in southwest Montana? Those who were massacred, the, the descendants of those who were massacred, welcome the descendants of those who did the massacring to join together and walk through the darkness into the dawn carrying lanterns. 
and then to sit in a forgiveness circle. God dwells in the thick darkness. Let's close with Natalie Diaz, my good friend, sister in poetry, Mojave. She says, let me disappear into intimacy with you. Let me disappear into church and darkness. Thanks for being here. I know we're not following our tight schedule, but let's just take 30, 45 seconds to just absorb the, the beauty and the gift of the words received. And I'll have a few announcements as we go. Let's just soak that in. Thank you. Spirit, continue to teach us, continue to open us up. Thank you that you don't break us down, but you break us open. Thank you for going ahead of us now into jazz improvisation as racial reconciliation and liberative justice. We ask your blessing on the rest of this weekend. In Christ's name. So a few announcements, and then Shan will give us the closing blessing. Um, also, just quickly, Luke Powery was supposed to be with us as well, offering prayers, but he was physically ill, so he wasn't able to, to participate. But he is one of, my, one of our keynote panelists for March 9th through 11th. So Luke Powery will be with us speaking on Howard Thurman. So he sends his greetings and his apologies for for not being able to be to participate. Uh, three announcements. Tomorrow, if you would please wear your lanyard, because we want to know each other's names. So please wear your lanyard tomorrow. Also, please bring your folder, your registration folder, because we're going to be using this tomorrow morning. This yellow one is your personal scribble sheet. So it's going to be like a little journal exercise tomorrow morning. So bring your whole folder tomorrow. And note that there is a book table right outside. It's self-serve, Venmo, we trust you, just you know, whatever you can afford. There's a, a wide range, as you'll see. And, and, and a lot of that will go towards scholarships for Shalem. Um, also, if, if we could have some volunteers help carry the registration table over to the chapel. We have two people in charge of it, but there's more stuff. So maybe I could recruit Adam and Ajwa and Liz, if you could help carry some stuff, would that be okay? Okay, Ajwa, um, maybe Prudence or Lee, we, we, need, we need a little bit of help with that. Okay, thank you. We'll see you tomorrow at 9.30 and see you at the concert. It's gonna be amazing. Trey said they sound really awesome. <laughs> okay, what, a, what an honor to be together. Let me use this one, it's a little better. This is going to be our first Native Nations Poet Laureate of the United States. Joy Harjo, a prayer of hers encased in Isaiah. Here we go. Join with me just in listening and receiving. Arise, shine. Your light has come. She had some horses. She had horses who were bodies of sand. She had horses who were maps drawn of blood. She had horses who were skins of ocean water. She had horses who were the blue air of sky. She had horses who were fur and teeth. She had horses who were clay and would break. She had horses who were splintered red cliff. She had some horses. She had horses with eyes of trains. She had horses with full brown thighs. She had horses who laughed too much. She had horses who threw rocks at glass houses. She had horses who licked razor blades. She had some horses. 
She had horses who danced in their mother's arms. She had horses who thought they were the sun and their bodies shone and burned like stars. She had horses who waltzed nightly on the moon. She had horses who were much too shy and kept quiet in stalls of their own making. She had some horses. She had horses who liked creek stomp dance songs. She had horses who cried in their beer. She had horses who spit at male queens who made them afraid of themselves. She had horses who said they weren't afraid. She had horses who lied. She had horses who told the truth who were stripped bare of their tongues. She had some horses. She had horses who called themselves horse. She had horses who called themselves spirit and kept their voices secret and to themselves. She had horses who had no names. She had horses who had books of names. She had some horses. She had horses who whispered in the dark, who were afraid to speak. She had horses who screamed out of fear of the silence, who carried knives to protect themselves from ghosts. She had horses who waited for destruction. She had horses who waited for resurrection. She had some horses. She had horses who got down on their knees for any savior. She had horses who thought their high price had saved them. She had horses who tried to save her, who climbed in her bed at night and prayed as they raped her. She had some horses. She had some horses she loved. She had some horses she hated. These were the same horses. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has arisen upon you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Shan. Thank you. Uh, since the musicians are waiting for us, and some of them have traveled a, a ways to get here, I know you want to mingle, but can we mingle there? So can we swiftly go over? Also, next, next time, I'm going to have this session be two and a half hours long, because we need <laughs> Q&A time. All right, thanks. <laughs>